Falling Walls Circle, Challenges and Foresight. Welcome to the Falling Walls Plenary Table, Climate Action Future. Oh, hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> so welcome to our audience here in Berlin and to all of you watching online, wherever you are in the world, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So nice to have you with us. And by the way, you can put any questions you have in the chat. We'll be coming to your questions later. Now, I'm Vivian Parry. I'm a science writer and broadcaster, British. And our plenary table concerns the most pressing challenge of our time, climate change. No one on the planet remains unaware of the problem, yet the response to climate change has been inadequate and slow. With COP28 almost upon us, what do we need to do to make it as successful as possible? What walls do we need to break down so that we mobilize as much human ingenuity and resource as possible to counter climate change and move beyond climate action failure. And now I'd like to welcome on our panel, and perhaps you'd all come on. And I'm just going to say, do come on. And I'm just going to say that quickly, that we did have a gender balanced panel for this. Uh, but unfortunately, you know all those last minute things that happen. Well, they all happened. And uh, thank you to all the people who stood in at the very last minute. They're all in a unique position to advise us on how to move forward. And I'm going to introduce them to you, uh, director of the Potsdam Institute. And I can think that you can be a, a local boy, even though you are a Swede. Uh, Johan Jokström, who's Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Uh, he's an internationally renowned scientist. He's led development on the planetary boundaries framework. But the, for the public, he is the scientist that got to work with David Attenborough uh, on the hit 2021 Netflix documentary, Breaking Boundaries. Lars Peter Reisegaard is the director of the Global Greenhouse Gas Watch in the World Meteorological Organization Secretariat, where he led, amongst many other things, the development of the Global Basic Observing Network. Previously with NASA, he gets all the top jobs. Uh, his special interest is weather prediction. Fred Fenter is chief executive editor of the open access publisher Frontiers, the third most cited research publisher. There are no less than 228 Frontiers journals, from Frontiers in Acoustics to Frontiers in Space Technology, <coughs> as well as many on climate and sustainability. Fred oversees one of the largest editorial boards in scientific publishing, but atmospheric science is his own discipline. Lee Howell is the executive director of the Villas Institute, which is a Swiss non-profit foundation dedicated to accelerating the transition to a net zero and nature positive economy by promoting systems leadership and intergenerational collaboration. And he did that after a small career of 20 years at the World Economic uh, Forum. Finally, Masamba Choi, possibly our most important panelist. I say that because he leads the UN Climate Change Innovation Hub at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and is a convener for COP28, which, as we know, takes place in three weeks' time in Dubai. It's a critical meeting at a critical time, and the world needs it to be as successful as possible. So let me start uh, with you, Masamba. The challenges are huge. We could all spend a lot of time blaming and shaming. But this is not the point, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we want to move beyond climate action failure. So reform has already begun. Why is there a risk of failure? And how do we reinvigorate? Thank you. And uh, good morning to all of you. Um, there are mainly two 
um, driver, let's say, of risk of climate failure. The first is the fact that the flow of finance is not adequately aligned with the climate goal. So recently, the World Energy Investment Foresight predict that more than one trillion US dollar will be invested in fossil fuel. So this investment trend in fossil fuel will um, raise some challenge, including the risk of locking that would put policymakers in a situation where they will have to choose between implementing the right policy instrument with the risk of having stranded asset and a financial failure, or not implementing the right climate policy with the risk of facing a climate failure. The second aspect is the fact that the most transformative type of climate action are based actually on solutions that can disrupt the product and services that are currently used to satisfy core human needs, but that are uh, generating a lot of negative externalities. So these product are, these solutions are disruptive in the sense that they can disrupt entire value chain. So it means that unless they are able to accommodate the repurposing of the skills and competence in these obsolete value chain, unless they are in the capability of repurposing the assets that are in the obsolete value chain, they will not be implemented at scale. These are, in my view, two important obstacles to um, the implementation at scale of um, climate action. Now, how to go beyond this failure? So first of all, we need to work on what I would call the inner development goal. The focus has been so far on the outer development goal, the sustainable development goal. But we will not be able to address the challenge of climate and sustainability if we do not do something with our inner development goal. And what do you mean by inner development goal? They can be articulated around three main principles. Caring, sharing, and daring. First, caring. We need to, if you want to address the challenge, to genuinely care about the well-being and the needs of the many people and the planet. The focus should be on the people. And the question should be, how can we satisfy their needs in terms of nutrition and health, shelter, access to product and services, leisure, clothing, how can we satisfy these needs in a way that is aligned with the climate and sustainability goal? And the good news is, by taking this approach, we expand the space for climate and sustainability innovation, because we can access some type of climate action that otherwise we will not be able to access. Second, sharing. We cannot address this big challenge if we are not sharing. Sharing of knowledge first. And this is why for us open science is extremely important. Sharing of solution 
We are expecting the climate actor to be solution provider. It's not just about solving my problem, reducing my emission, but it's more about developing solutions that others also can use. Third, daring. The problem that we are facing with climate and sustainability is that most of the time, when we are setting goal and target in this area, we tend to set the goal and the target basis on the basis of our perception of what is possible, not what is needed. And this is precisely the gap between what is needed and what is possible, which is the main driver for innovation. And most of the time, policy makers and uh, decision makers in corporate will tell you, I cannot be more ambitious because I don't have the solution and I want to be credible. If somebody asks me, how will you go about implementing your, achieving your target, I will not be able to respond because I do not have yet the solution. We consider that this is actually one of the main barriers to um, transformative climate action because it locked us into a vicious circle. If you ask those that are setting goal why you are not ambitious, they will respond, because we do not have the solution. And if you ask the solution developer, why are, why are you not bold? Why are you not transformative with your solution? They will respond, because there is no demand. We have to break this vicious circle. And I'm going to stop you there, Ms. Amber, because on your caring, sharing and daring, I think, Lee, daring is something that you're particularly interested in. You've done a lot of inter intergenerational work, and I know that you want to turn people from eco-anxiety to eco-ambition, to be daring. Absolutely, um, because what we're facing, of course, is both a sprint and a marathon, and we have to sort of think about this, and there's some urgency, but there's, there's a longer term piece. And working backwards, uh, let's assume that we're able to fulfill the goals that we've set in 2050. The people that will be literally responsible for driving, owning, shaping the solutions, where are they today? Well, they're most likely in high school or middle school. So we need to really uh, help them sort of get over this wall of eco-anxiety and get to a place of eco-ambition. And, and to do that, um, and also actually uh, stimulates sort of their entrepreneurial drive. Um, you know, I, I look across and see Johan and, and I think of the planetary boundaries. The game is actually how do we prosper within those boundaries, right? And, and if we can get that uh, into the minds of the young people uh, and see the entrepreneurial potential, then I think we're on the right course from, from a marathon perspective. Now, there's the sprint that we'll talk about in a moment. And in that context, there's just two things I think is very important. One, recognize that what we're talking about are interdisciplinary problems that fundamentally require intergenerational solutions. Right? So we have to build that in. That's not a, it's not a byproduct. It has to be thought through and, and, and integrated. Second, how do we go from anxiety to a sense of ambition or aspiration? That requires agency, right? the sense that you can shape these systems. What's missing in that, and I, this is where I spend a lot of time both with secondary and tertiary education institutions in our, in our work at the foundation, but also as a, as a professor, is introducing the concept of systems thinking. Because the thesis is that the world is a complex system. If we don't understand and, and embrace that, then of course the natural reaction is, will be that this is, you know, you'll be either filled with anxiety, uh, possibly ambivalence or apathy, and even anger. But if you understand that you're part of a complex system and that there are parts of it, there's nodes, there's pieces of it that you can influence. Um, and uh, and we, we think about the choice every day that we make, the, the food choice or mobility choice, it could be good for our health and good for the planet. We have agency. Uh, but we need to understand that it sits in, nests in uh, the notion of complex systems. And that's what we spend a lot of time in. If you understand and become a systems thinker, then the next step is actually becoming a systems leader. And this is, I think, Somebody made a great point. Then you go from the IQ to really elements of the EQ um, about your inner self, how do you lead, how do you approach it, how do you change a system where you have no actual authority, 
right? You have to, during the development. Right. Yeah. And you have to, you know, and, and, and you really, it's all about having a parent authority, or at least getting that and working with stakeholders. Um, that's a whole different set, but it starts with the premise of understanding how systems work, complex systems. That's how the interdependent piece of it is, is I think we intuitively can understand. Uh, from there, then I think we could uh, all be a part of this. And it starts you know, very early on. And again, if we work backwards from 2050, then we need to get started already in the schools today. Now, I'm going to ask our audience how, to put up their hands if they're under 30. I don't ask them their age, because they or guess their age. Under 30, put up your hand. We've only got a few, and I'm hoping that you're all thinking about not being eco-anxious, but being eco-ambitious, uh, having heard that. And anybody online, we want you to be eco-ambitious. Uh, we've been talking a bit about uh, systems. Uh, Johan, I mean, you think about uh, systems. I mean, what are your reflections? How do we be, go beyond uh, climate action failure? Yeah, I would like to pick up on, on Lee's point about sprinting and, and marathon, because I think that is an absolutely key fundamental issue we need to recognize here, that we are in trouble. We are in deep trouble. We're actually just six years away from having consumed the remaining global carbon budget to have any chance of holding 1.5 degrees Celsius. We need to urgently transform the global food system and not allow it to expand into intact nature. It has to stop now. So we are at this urgency point when, when, of course, we need inner sustainable development goals. Of course, we need to invest in moving from anxiety to ambition and having kind of value systems on the longer term. But we also need some, some panic buttons being pushed now. I argue, for example, that when we meet in three weeks' time in Dubai, this is the moment for the mitigation agenda to get serious. We've even written a letter to the COP28 presidency um, signed by Sandrine Dixon de Clare, the president of Club of Rome, and myself, saying, let's celebrate, dear friends, across all nations in the world, we've finished the Paris Agreement. There's nothing more to negotiate. It's all done. Every letter, every text in that agreement is set. Now we meet to deliver. And we need to deliver, we need to be accountable, we need to align with science, we need to put the money on the table, and we have to do it in an equitable way. Now it's time to pull up our sleeves and get serious. And that COP28 must be the mitigation COP. It must be the meeting when we start really showing credible pathways to phase out fossil fuels. And I'm of the view it's not a scientist that scares the under 30 in this room. It is the lack of leadership among the adult people in charge running the planet. And this is what has to happen, and that is a, that's a sprint point. And how do we do that? Well, I think it is, of course, we need to, just like as Sama points out, work both with, with the broad or daring questions, but I also think we have to have some regulatory hard decisions being taken. End dates on the internal combustion engine. Uh, simply prohibit any further investments in new exploration of oil, coal, and gas. And we know that this is still happening in the UK, in Norway, in China, Sorry. in Russia. <laughs> so it's a, it, this is, these are big decisions that need to be taken because we are moving in a trajectory where we will pass the limits of adaptation, pass the limits of social stability, and, and quite frankly, risking to push the planet irreversibly on a trajectory that would undermine life support systems on Earth. So I think there is that, that, that action urgency. And let me just close by saying that I, I so totally agree on this transition from anxiety to ambition, ambition. And isn't it a beautiful reality that, you know, now soon 10 years after Paris, we can, with very high degree of empirical evidence, say that we can tell that story. It's not only a story of risk, it's also a story of having the scalable solutions, and that those scalable solutions give better outcomes. The health synergy that Lee talked about, but also, you know, we have nine million people dying prematurely every year because of air pollution, because of fossil fuel burning. We have so much evidence that moving towards a green energy future gives much more independent, resilient, and prosperous societies. Even in Germany, during the crisis of the gas pipe being chopped in the Baltic, you had stories of communities that 20 years back invested in biogas and solar panels and a wind farm, and they were completely independent. You know, no impact at all. You know, they were resilient to that shock from the very start. Sweden introduced a carbon price of 100 euros per tonne of carbon dioxide when? 1990 phased out all oil and gas, 
is totally decarbonized in its heating system today, zero impact of a pipeline being chopped in the Baltic 30 years ago. You know, you can't actually follow attractive pathways. And I think that's part of this sprint decisions that I'd love to see as well coming up on the climate action agenda. Let me move to last, Peter, because uh, are, we, are we gathering the right sort of information in order to ensure that, that you know, we don't get climate action failure? Yes and no. <clears throat> we have some of it. Um, I'm going to draw a curve in the air. Uh, it looks like this. This is uh, how the CO2 concentrations are going. Uh, and you can put timelines on it for the major climate accords. Uh, you can put Rio, Kyoto, and Paris there. And you cannot see any impact at all. None. If you had told uh, the signatories to the Paris Agreement um, eight years ago that nothing would happen to that curve as a result of that, they would have laughed at you. And th they said, well, Johan just said, we have all the agreement that we need uh, to do this, so now we are going to act. We're still not acting, uh, and I think uh, part of it is that we are not treating this as a scientific problem, uh, which is what uh, the text of the Paris Agreement actually says that uh, we should. We are not unpacking that curve. We are not seeing when and where does this happen, why does it happen, and we cannot. I was at the, um, the, the, a big uh, climate science conference in uh, Kigali a couple of weeks ago, one of the lead authors of the sixth assessment report of the IPCC said something which is really remarkable. We cannot today tie our emissions to future greenhouse gas concentrations and therefore to climate scenarios. We have to, otherwise we will not be able to compel uh, parties to act. Uh, right now we are doing a lot of good things uh, uh, and I resonate very much with uh, what Lee said. Uh, we, need, we need agency, uh, we need uh, to empower people, uh, and uh, a lot of good ideas are around, a lot of uh, good mitigation uh, steps are being taken. Some of them may be good, some of them may be not so good, but we are not tying them to what they are doing to the atmosphere. Ultimately, uh, uh, the, this uh, uh, greenhouse gas concentration curve is what is driving climate change, and unless and until we unpack that and see what are the consequences of um, uh, the actions that we are taking, being it phasing out fossil fuels, be it uh, uh, planting trees, uh, be, uh, be it uh, doing things that are even more fanciful, putting stuff into the ocean to make it alkaline or make algae grow or whatever. If we don't tie that to what is happening with the, uh, 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 what is happening, uh, with the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, we are flying somewhat blind uh, into uh, uh, into the future, and that is not agency. Mm. Uh, let me go back to uh, uh, Masamba's caring, sharing, and daring, and, uh, and ask you, Fred, I mean, uh, sharing um, is something that you're passionate about in terms of open access. Yeah. Thanks, Vivian. Yeah, actually, sharing, I, I wrote it down as Masamba was talking, and that was actually going to be the, uh, the, the, the key word for, for the few words. Uh, uh, yeah, I, you know, so I'm here, and also the word sprinting also, there's this, there's, I think sometimes we, we lose sense of the, the urgency of the situation. So what, what can I say as, as a publisher? Um, I think that what we can say is that the outcomes of science can be better shared, and they can be better shared in, with, with, a sense of, with a sense of urgency. I mean, I don't think there, I don't think there, um, isn't, there isn't anybody, I think, in, the, in, the, uh, in academia or scientific publishing that doesn't recognize that we need to move towards an open science context. Uh, we, we talk about it quite a bit, and it's the subject of many, many conferences. Um, but I think it's happening way too slowly, and I think a lot of us uh, in, in publishing think it's happening way too slowly. I mean, last year, just to, just to draw an analogy, last year at this meeting we were still wearing those horribly uncomfortable red masks. I, I don't know if, if, if everybody remembers that. We um, kept them all as a souvenir. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, the, um, the, 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 the COVID pandemic emergency in the, in the publishing context actually taught us a very important lesson. And that was when all the publishers pulled together and made the corpus of material, regardless of what the business model of the publication of that material was, available in the CORD-19 database, um, that really caused the, the wheels of the research innovation cycle to spin, and it, and it, and it actually improved the lives of, of tens of millions of people through, through, uh, through, uh, through mitigation of, of, uh, of, of their suffering. 
Um, and, I, and I think what we have to say is that the climate emergency requires exactly the same sense of urgency. And this is the message that we would like to bring to COP28, is that open science can be part of this, of this um, uh, toolkit of solutions in terms of addressing the, the, the climate emergency. And for a number of reasons, you know, first of all, we talked about this morning, it levels the international playing field. Any researcher who starts a research question has to have access to the full scientific corpus of knowledge as a prerequisite. Um, and this is something I think something we, lose, we lose sight of. Um, and it's, it is clear, you know, we hear all the time from startups who, you know, having an informal discussion, people working in, directly in the research innovation cycle complaining about the fact that they have, they have uh, a, a, uh, they don't have full access to the, to the, to, 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 to the scientific knowledge that they, that, that they need in order to do their, to do their own work. Um, and I think, you know, while we weren't able to attend the previous session on, on AI, I was kind of listening a little bit uh, to, to, to pull a few, uh, a, 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 a few lessons out of that. But I think generative AI is something that's mentioned in, in all of these contexts. I mean, it's already making research, research faster, better, and more productive. And it's, it's going to clearly lead to advances in, 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 in insights in, in climate research. But in order to be reliable, these, 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 they have to be trained on sets of data based on, on validated scientific knowledge. And open science fully participates in that dynamic by providing this content into data sets without any intellectual property blockers. So, um, and I think finally, uh, open science builds public trust. And that's also something that we can't forget. So for, for many reasons, um, uh, we, we, we will go to COP28 and we will bring this message that, that open science has to be part of the solution in, in, in terms of addressing the, the, the climate emergency. I mean, I want an AI to be looking at uh, frontiers in space technology because there are surely insights up there in space, but perhaps nobody would think about looking at, at those kind of journals if... Uh, it wasn't open access. Uh, let me turn to another really pressing uh, question, is what does success look like? Now, I know you can't talk, <laughs> being a convener, you can't talk directly about uh, th that, Ms. Amber, but uh, who would like to take that? What does success look like at COP28? Johan. Well, I think there are, there are a few ways of answering that question, but I think, I think the first answer is, is really following on, on Lars Peter because it's really about numbers. You know, we are increasing emissions that are contributing to the curve that Lars Peter showed us uh, uh, virtually in, in the air of 1% per year. We need to bend this curve latest 2025 and start reducing between minus 5 to minus 10 globally per year to reach 50% reductions by 2030 and then cut emissions by half every decade until we have a net zero world economy in 2050, less than 30 years' time. That is what has to come out of COP28. That would be success, to have a credible plan of that bending curve and starting to phase out fossil fuels. So that's number one. But the number two is, is the following, which, which actually I, I really wish that we can have on the table in all the discussions on climate action, which is that not even that will be enough, because all the climate models that gives us that orderly phase out have actually already factored in an assumption that the global food system will go from being the single largest source, five gigatons, to becoming the single largest sink, up to 10 gigatons. They assume massive scaling of negative emission technologies, carbon capture storage, direct air capture, which is a few million tons today at pilot scale, to go to gigaton scale of up to 10, 25% equivalent of global emissions by the second half of this century. And not even that is enough. We need to keep the ocean stable, and we need to keep all intact nature stable, which sucks up 56% of emissions today, the biggest subsidy to the world economy. So, dear friends, delivery on success is a global sustainability transformation. It's across food, nature, technology, and energy transitions. It has to happen simultaneously in a sprint. That would be success. Go for okay. it. OK, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to add to that? Um, uh, Lars Peter. I resonate probably more with the, what you said in your first intervention. Success will be that we start taking mitigation seriously. I love the vision. I love the ambition. I don't see the political willingness to go uh, quite as far as, as, uh, as you said. 
I, I, is, yeah, is yeah. I, I, I would settle for something maybe slightly less ambitious, but nonetheless very important. I would like to see a global system implemented with uh, uh, openness and transparency that will let us understand what we are doing and let us understand the consequences uh, of this, which today we do not. We are making all the assumptions that you mentioned, Johan. We are also assuming that uh, the ocean will keep taking up half of our excess emissions. Th this is insanity. Th this will not happen. And we are not being honest uh, 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 to each other and to our politicians about that. I would love to see us make a breakthrough on that in, uh, in Dubai. And then we can talk about what the success looked like in the longer time. So, Lee, you've had years and years of wrangling politicians, presidents, and tech bros in black cashmere jumpers. <laughs> so, how, do, how do you make this up? What does the success look like for you? Well, I think success, I think first you should recognize, um, you know, um, what those walls or barriers are, and we spoke about one of them. Um, one is a generational one. I think we also have to just be honest about the geopolitical piece. Um, and there are things we can still, there's wins there too. I mean, for example, it's, I think it's hard for most of us to fathom and, and sort of think of China and Saudi Arabia as developing countries in this sort of narrative, right, context. And, and so um, maybe there's going to be a, a sort of revisiting of what we mean by who's on the developed side or developing side. And that, that's, that can be politically done, I think. So we'll, um, there are some areas, uh, I think food is the most exciting one for me. Um, uh, because of my long-standing work in collaboration with Johan on this, but the reality is that it, it, is the, it is the nexus in the system. It is able to address a third of climate uh, emissions, but it's the biggest consumer of water. It is the primary source of habitat loss, which is driving, you know, obviously biodiversity loss. It's also a major employer for most of the South and the world. So we have, we, if we could pick, figure out a few places where we're going to really concentrate, particularly food, I'd be very happy. And then there are things like methane that we, you know, hopefully will come on the table and such. Um, and, I, and, and of course, the perennial question of coal. But back to what would success look like is I also think we need to um, uh, talk about and be very open about some technologies that we've sort of put to the side in the past. And, I'm, and I'll be very, you know, if you think about young people today, they've done the math. They recognize that nuclear needs to be part of this. Um, they have views on carbon abatement, but we need to, and, and that's not to t take away from the urgent piece, for sure. But we have to imagine that the talent pipeline that we'll need 10 to 15 years from now, we have to inspire today. You know, if we discover fusion, and um, I think there's a, a member of my board is a speaker here, David Gunn, who's, who's very knowledgeable about this, but he, I'm sure, you know, we've had conversations, and he said, look, you can't grow these, ex you know, these, those, these, this expertise overnight. You have to have a narrative that says, hey, here's where the opportunity sits. So I think we have to be hard-nosed as, as, as on this sprint, but then we have to sort of lay out and say, look, there, let's fall in love with this problem. That's what entrepreneurs do, right? At the end of the day, the kind of the guys that wear jumpers, they're, they, you know, they talk about the, the problem. You're never going to let me forget no, that. No, 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 but I, mean, I just realized. <laughs> but, I, I'm not, but I think the, the reality is you have to, and scientists too, and that's, the, I, that's my great respect, they fall in love with the problem. They're not going to give up. That's grit. And if you read all the literature about management and, and success in business, it's all about grit, right? That's what some of the experts say. So if we can get people to become, fall in love with this problem, young people, us, everyone, um, we'll get somewhere. And, 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 and I don't think we'll get too far if we're too judgmental. That's the other thing. They go back to the, the inner peace. I don't know, as a parent, I'm not very successful in getting some of my, my points across in a certain tone and approach. And I think we have to um, recognize that. Yeah. Right? I'm not saying there's children around the table at these negotiation conferences, but we have to understand and appreciate that they're humans and they're going to react in certain ways and certain approaches. So I do think um, let's figure out a way to get people, again, past, the, past the, 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 the shortcomings of the solutions, but then get excited about the problem again. Ms. Samba, one, I guess I'm very conscious we must go to the audience for questions. Yeah, just one. I just want like, to add one dimension. So it's not just about decarbonization. I don't think we're hearing you at the moment. It's not just about decarbonization. <laughs> uh, it's also about development. So the future I would like to see build for our children and grandchildren is a future where flourishing life can be provided to the many people and done in a way that is aligned 
with the climate and sustainability goal. A society that is productive and not extractive, a society that is regenerative and not destructive, and a society that is empowering and not alienating, where the well-being of the many people everywhere in the world are taken into account and addressed, where people have meaningful jobs that they like, that they enjoy, and that they can execute with passion. Fantastic. And Fred, I'm sure that you want to see uh, a charter for open access, which perhaps will something will come to uh, a little later. But Adam, uh, what have people been saying online? What about the audience, who so I'm sure have a, questions? Yeah, just a reminder to the audience here, if you have a, a question for our fantastic pan panellists, uh, raise your hand and we'll make sure a microphone gets to you. But while you're thinking up your question, I'll get us started. We've already spoken about the urgency of this year's climate negotiations, COP28, but already there's been a lot of scepticism about whether this COP, and particularly this presidency, can live up to that, um, with, for example, over 100 law, um, lawmakers in the European Union and America complaining about the presidency that it's not only um, uh, being presided over by a business person, but an oil business person. Are these concerns legitimate and how can we overcome these concerns to make sure COP28 is a good COP? Johan, I think this is one for you because... <laughs> yeah, to, to begin with, the, the, the criticisms are legitimate. There is um, you know, a justified reason for concern. Um, we have had the privilege from the scientific community to have many bilaterals with both Sultan al-Jaber but also the COP28 presidency. I'm personally convinced that um, Sultan al-Jaber really wants to make COP28 a success. He is serious about moving on the mitigation agenda. They're really trying to take on the broad agenda of development at the COP meeting. And um, staying in this room, uh, I think we should use this as an opportunity of having the first COP meeting led by a country that has a remarkable and unprecedented convening power for the nations in the world that host oil, gas mm. and coal, particularly state-owned oil and gas and coal companies. So what I'm hoping is that we can actually turn this uh, justified uh, worry around and use it for our benefit because this is the moment to get the, the real fossil fuel nations around the table. But of course, the jury is still out there. So we'll see how far it goes. But we've chosen, at least uh, uh, I think many of us in the scientific community, to, to go in this in a, in, a, in a way to give it a chance. Uh, but, but keeping our lines very, very <laughs> clearly along the scientific uh, levels of integrity. Uh, uh, Lars, Peter. I fully agree. Uh, I um, know there's a lot of skepticism, and I think uh, uh, there are probably good reasons for that. For better or worse, this is the process that we have. Uh, and it would be very, very unfortunate just to walk away from it because of who's hosting it. I, I don't think that is to anyone's benefit. Uh, uh, we intend uh, to be there uh, and uh, to follow negotiations and uh, try to instill uh, in the negotiations the, the things that we have been talking around, uh, uh, about around the table here. And I think we have to. I think we have to. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. And, uh, Let's Welcome. take another question. I believe we have a question from our audience. So I think you have a microphone already. Great. Yes, uh, thank you for the interesting discussion. Um, part of the equation, the increase of the world's population. Um, isn't the situation just totally hopeless uh, if the world population keeps on growing? We will never have a sustainable solution if there's an increasing pressure on resources as food, water, and energy. And if that just keeps on growing, uh, how can you how can you find how can you talk about a sustainable solution if you if that is not somehow addressed? Lee, so I think again the sprint and marathon, but I think in reality, um, most of us in this room, um, the, the big demographic shift we're going to live through is aging, and in fact that's the one that we've never experienced, and so we don't really understand the political economy of that. I'm, I'm, I'm I was born and raised in Japan, and, and of course Italy and Japan are very similar, but that's something I think we should first contextualize is that. Um, the vast majority of the industrialized world, there'll be more people over the age of 
65 than under the age of 15. That will be how the, the, it will be a very different uh, shape. And that will have, you know, reverberate. So that's why I'm focusing on the long term about how we have a much more ambitious, productive youth because we're going to depend on them. Certainly my pension and your pension and others, um, among other things beyond these global challenges. Uh, then second, I think uh, just overall, we do know that there was, uh, the, the curves show us that we'll get to it, but there'll be a decline because um, we also know that certain, you know, part of the prosperity narrative is that we see a shift in, 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 in population size in those economies. So I'm, um, you know, generally, I, I, think, I think most of us recognize that that's a marathon kind of a sort of view. It's good to have that horizon, but um, I think that's not the problem. I think I, I agree with you here. We need to kind of keep our, 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 our focus on the sprint part of it now because that's, those are other problems, and I don't think it'll be the traditional sort of Malthusian thing that we sort of in, intuit around population growth. I do think this demographic shift to, to an aging society is something we none of us really appreciate at the moment. And of course, education and making sure that well, women have education. Yeah. And the notion of lifelong learning. Critically important. These transitions are going to be about lifelong learning for everyone in this room, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just a very small yeah. point to this. I totally agree with Lee, but there's also uh, two, two additional elements here. One is that between now and 2050, there's very little we can do on the population growth curve. Uh, the girls are born, cultures change slowly. We're basically, I think, having a moral obligation to fit world development within planetary boundaries for nine billion people, whether we like it or not. We are on that trajectory. Number two, we know from the evidence that the primary cause for the problems we have is not the number of people, it is inequity. It is really the rich minority over consuming resources. It's not the vast majority of poor people. We have a problem, of course, if this vast majority stepped onto the same lifestyle that has caused the problem in the first place. That would be a disaster for, for humanity on planet Earth. But, but it's not the cause, the primary cause for the challenges we have today. So I think we have to keep, keep those elements in addition to your demographic transition in, in, into context. We have a quick multiple choice question from our online audience. Right. Um, who is it that actually needs to act? Is it society, policymakers, industry, research, all of the above? OK, right. One word answer from you all. OK. <laughs> yeah, all of the above, but policymakers first. <laughs> Lars Peter. All of the above poli politicians. Right. I would have to agree with the policy making. Okay. All Lee? The above with policy making. Yeah, I think policy making that can make all of the rest of it come together. Yeah. Masamba. I think all of them has a very important role to play. We need an integrated approach where innovative policy from policy makers are combined with innovative technology, innovative financial instrument, innovative business model, and innovative cooperative approach. What is sure is if you only act on one or two of this level, we will not achieve our goal. We need to act on all this level in a combined manner. You know, David, I always t tell my, my students that if, if, if what we're talking about here was a Tour de France race, science has the yellow shirt yeah. right at the front. Of course. Yes. Business is hanging in just behind science. You know how it is, you can float along very nicely. Policy is way behind in the peloton. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just and, and we need to bring them on board so we all can flow along together. Yes. Right, yellow jerseys for all scientists. Um, I'm going to finish, uh, if I may now, with asking you each uh, a really important question, which is, what walls do we most need to break to get over this climate action failure? So you're only allowed, I'm going to give you my magic wand. <laughs> you're only allowed kind of one, one thing that you can uh, say. So, Masamba, let's go to you. Silo. We need a radical collaboration among nations and within nations. So collaboration for you. Lee? Yeah, it's the wall of anxiety, the fear of failure. We can't, we can't afford that. We have to embrace this and, and actually flip it around, right? And we have to appreciate that those closer to the problem may actually be closer to the solution. Hmm. Johan. It goes in line with, with Lee. I think that the number one falling wall is that we need to reshape the whole narrative to prove that decarbonizing the world and staying within planetary boundaries is a better world, is a, is a modern, is the future. It's basically what, what we are all seeing as the winning path for the future. Not as today as seeing that we have problems, 
of environmental change that we need to solve through willingness to pay, policies that gives this impression that you have to, the stranded asset issue and kind of sacrifice. We have to start showing this to be the winning path, which it is. Last, Peter. I would love to see uh, a couple of walls fall in the process at the COP. There, we talk about the COP as a monolith. There are actually three COPs going on, uh, one between the negotiators, one between the scientists, and then the angry COP uh, among, uh, among the young people and the NGOs who are frustrated with it. Uh, that will not work. We need the walls between the, the, the science and the uh, policy making to fall, uh, and we need that to fall in Dubai if we can. And how do we do that? I'm going to spend two weeks trying to do it, uh, and uh, I'm sure Johan will uh, be doing uh, the same thing uh, among uh, many other people. We need to engage in a dialogue with them and bring them back to the text of what the agreement actually said. Uh, they are lost somewhat in the process, in the weeds of, uh, of negotiating Article 6.2, 6.4, 6.8. I, I don't know whether that means anything to you. But it, it, um, they are, uh, in, in a sense, uh, uh, becoming victims of, uh, of low ambitions by negotiating increasingly intricate details in a very convoluted text. Go back and see what the agreement actually said and see, are we implementing this? If not, let's think about it differently and let's think about how can we implement it. Because scientists didn't do too well in, t uh, in, in grappling with policymakers during uh, COVID. I mean, they, they went okay for a while, and then, you know, things got ignored and people said, we're following the science, when in fact they weren't following any kind of science at all. But, you know, how do we do that? Because it's a major issue. It is a major issue, and uh, we need to... Um, we need to not be alarmist, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, many of us are, and there are things about this that are really alarming. But uh, I, I resonate with what Lee was saying. There, there's, there are certain styles of communication that work and so, certain styles of uh, communications that do not work. You mentioned naming and shaming, I think, in your opening, and it's, it's very easy for us to do. I mean, we, uh, we have all kinds of evidence of things that are going wrong, and we have certain ways to communicate that. If I go back to where, what you said about your kids, shaming your kids, uh, however justified it is, doesn't work. And I'm not sure it works in the context of, uh, of COP either. And it is actually very easy to do that. We need to engage in a dialogue with them and make sure that we all go into this with open eyes. And if uh, I know I was only allowed to say one thing, but um, <laughs> I'm, gonna say, I'm gonna say one more thing. It is not just about mitigation, because we, um, what Johan said about how steeply we need to uh, reduce fossil fuel emissions, that curve gets steeper and steeper every year we don't act. And at some point, we are going to have to recognize we're not going to get there. We need to adapt to that, and we need to adapt to that with open eyes, and that is a dialogue that we can have with, uh, uh, with politicians and policymakers. Okay. Um, Fred, what about you? So, you know, uh, what I would say is that the wall that needs to fall is just very directly linked to, to the way that we're currently now sharing, to go back to Masamba's word, sci scientific knowledge. And the, we're not recognizing the urgency of, of the societal challenges, and we have to move very, very rapidly to a, uh, a, a very a, a clearly an open science uh, context. And um, what about the charter, the open access charter? Yeah, so I'm happy to say a few words about the, uh, about the Open Access Charter. I was going to say a little bit about collaboration. We didn't have time to, to get into that, but uh, the, 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 the Charter is a, um, um, one, of the, one of the things that we're going to be bringing to COP28. So the Open Science Charter is a, um, is a document that we've prepared in, in broad partnership with a, with a, number, with a number of stakeholders. <laughs> And I think we've got a, uh, we've got a slide, I think. I think so. Think. There should, should be a slide. The timing, so the timing of this meeting is excellent because we're going to be officially launching this at COP28, but this is sort of a soft launch. Um, and the idea of the Charter is to call upon the scientific community and institutes of, institutions of research to commit to full open access for all scientific publications by, by 2030. Um, and it also calls for publishers and other stakeholders and, and institutions to allocate resources for publication for, and, for public, and for editorial services in a more transparent way, and to move finally to a functional marketplace based on competition for editorial quality and for editorial services. 
And so we, we think that one of the major outcomes of this will be to restore the public's faith and trust in science. So I would encourage you all to please read the Open Science Charter uh, and support it. Fred, thank you so much, and um, thank you to all our panellists. And can I just conclude this by saying that actually Masamba's words are the things uh, that resonate with me, and indeed, I think, all the panel and the audience, which is caring, sharing, and daring is the way to end climate action failure. Thank you so much to our audience and for those of you online. Goodbye for now, and it's been a pleasure having you with us. Thank you. Thank you.